Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, SBC 205 Public Speaking. I am again Victor McInnes, your public speaking instructor, coming to you live on tape for my COVID-19 compound here in the heart of the greater Grovetown, Georgia metro area, the Aiken Tech Outpost in Columbia County. Hey, today our lecture is being brought to you by your pets. You know who's wondering why you've been spending so much time at home? Your pets. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about today is chapter one. We're going to start with chapter one. We're going to talk a little bit about why we study public speaking. We're going to do a lot of modeling. We're going to look at a lot of communication models, uh, and then we're going to uh, uh, sort of wrap up. We'll do a lecture two because I understand that these lectures can get tedious because, to be honest with you, occasionally I get a little bored with them while I'm giving them. But So we're going to break chapters one and two up into two smaller lectures. Uh, chapter 2 will probably post sometime tomorrow. Okay, um, so let's jump into the concept of public speaking. Now, the, the textbook that you've been given, it's free, so you're getting what you paid for. It's a pretty good textbook on public speaking. Um, uh, but what I want to do is talk to you just real quick. The best part about the book is the opening uh, paragraph where it says, public speaking is the process of designing and delivering a message to an audience. Effective public speaking involves understanding your audience and speaking goals, choosing elements for the speech that will engage your audience with your topic, and delivering your message skillfully. Good public speakers understand that they must plan, organize, and revise their material in order to develop an effective speech. And that really just sums up everything we're going to be doing uh, in this course. Uh, uh, the, the first thing uh, we need to understand, and, you, and again, I, I, I talked to you about this uh, last time in our little introduction, but again, in the 21st century, a lot of people keep saying, you know, is, is the technological age sort of dawned on us back 20 years ago, during their, 30 years ago, during the early 1990s. People were beginning to say, you know, public speaking is going to be a dying skill. Nobody's ever going to need to public speak. Face-to-face -face communication is just going to go away. We'll do everything via email. Uh, and what we've seen over and over and over again is that that is absolutely not true. And if one thing about our current situation in the COVID-19 pandemic that's proven to be true is that public speaking is as, and public communication is as an essential skill now in the 21st century as it, it, it has ever been. Yeah, we can send textual data anywhere, anytime, really quickly. But when we decided, and, and states and nations and cities and colleges decided back in early and mid-March that we were going to shut down and no longer do face-to-face -face business, we were not going to eat in restaurants, we were not going to you know, sit in classrooms, we were not going to sit in offices. When we began to look at how we were going to manage that, what the first thing that everybody did wasn't, well, we'll just deal with it by email because that's the trend that's been happening for 30 years. They immediately drove to Zoom. They drove to any number of other apps and tools that are out there in order to make the communication that we're having right now possible. Uh, live communication, face-to-face, -face, as virtually as it may be, but virtual office hours, virtual meetings have become the norm. So rather than proving that we really don't need face-to-face -face communication and face-to-face -face communication is less important, uh, we've proven that it's actually just as important as it always was. And the way to see that and the way to really understand that is if you go back and you look at the last couple of Saturday Night Lives, Saturday Night Live did three episodes Saturday Night Live at home where uh, the cast members did their skits and wrote wrote uh, the comedy from their homes and performed them via Zoom, via YouTube. The first one, you could clearly see people where the cast members were just propping up iPads against a wall and shooting it. Um, but in each of those three programs, there's been three or four at a minimum skits about Zoom meetings and Zoom church uh, uh, meetings and Zoom exercise classes and stuff like that. And it's really just sort of driven home that we will do everything we can to do, have face-to-face -face contact. And you will be judged on how you perform that face-to-face -face contact. Are you the guy that, you know, has your Zoom meeting, excuse me, <clears throat> and then gets up and walks out of the room thinking you've frozen your image? Or, you know, are you the person who was caught dozing during a Zoom meeting? 
So people will do everything they can to have face-to-face -face contact. And it's got to be said in the modern day, even with the technology, you are going to be judged. But I want you to remember one thing as we move forward, okay? Public speaking is a skill, not a talent. It's a skill, not a talent. Now, a talent is a natural ability someone has, okay? Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Michael Jordan, I've been watching the uh, Last Dance on ESPN, the series about the 98 Bulls. Uh, Michael Jordan was an incredibly talented basketball player. He could palm a basketball. He had an amazing vertical leap. Uh, you know, those are talents, but he also had great skill. A skill is the ability to do something well with expertise. And we gain that expertise through repetition and through practice. Okay? I've already told you that you know I've had people come up to me and say, well, how do you teach public speaking? It's, someone, it's something people can or cannot do. And next week we're going to get into performance apprehension and we're going to really dig into that, what most people call stage fright. Okay, we're going to really dig into that. But remember that it is a skill. It is not a talent. You know, uh, I, I, whenever we're in class, I always ask the nursing students to hold their hands up and I ask if there's a phlebotomist in, in the room. And I said, what was it like the first time you drew blood? And they all just sort of freak out and they say, oh my God, it was awful. I said, well, how do you draw? How is it now when you draw blood? They just go, I just stick them and go. Okay, so we need to sort of be aware of that as we enter into this conversation we're going to have over the next 14 weeks about public speaking, is that public speaking is a skill. It is not a talent. It's a skill like drawing blood, like phlebotomy. It's a skill like uh, welding. It is a skill like carpentry. It is a skill like photography. It is something you can be taught. Okay, And the purpose of this course is going to be to refine those skills in line with the ATC policy of making the Aiken County workforce more economically viable in the 21st century. And that's just as simple as it is. So let's start off with one basic premise. We publicly speak or we publicly communicate to do one of three things. To inform, to entertain, or to persuade. Now, we're going to focus on two of those, to inform and to persuade, because entertaining speeches are a completely different thing. You don't do it in the professional workspace very often, okay, unless you're an a entertainer as your trade, okay? So we're going to focus on informing and persuading. But remember, we speak publicly to do one of three things, to inform, to persuade, and to entertain. So what we're going to launch into first, and I'm about to go to my slides, is we're going to launch into the human communication process. Going to get a sip of beverage here. Oh, our beverage today is Sprite with zero sugar. What's not as good as regular Sprite? Sprite with zero sugar. Okay, so let's go to the slides. And I will be off your screens for a while. I'm going to try. There we go. Okay. So let's talk about some communication principles. All right? So again, we speak publicly to do three things. One of three things. To inform to persuade, and to entertain. And we're going to go into that in a great deal of detail as this course, uh, especially those first two, as we go through this course. Now, the human communication process, it doesn't make any difference how you're communicating. It doesn't matter where you're communicating. It doesn't make any difference. When, 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 when humans interact and communicate, there are certain components that have got to be there. So, the components of human communication are, first of all, you have to have two knowing participants. So you have to have, first of all, more than one because we can debate intrapersonal communication, a person talking to themselves. Um, and really, psychologists will tell you that talking to yourselves and vocalization of your thoughts, as they would refer to it, is not actually communication. That's just you externalizing an internal process. Okay. Now, there are people who usually at this time stick their hand up and say, well, what about prayer? Well, okay, you may not accept God as a human, but if you are in a conversation with God and God is speaking back to you, there are still two knowing participants. Okay, what about animals? Well, we can debate whether or not two animals can communicate and how they communicate. And there's a lot of studies being done about certainly some of the higher... Cetaceans like whales and, and dolphins and, and some uh, 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 monkeys and apes. Um, can you communicate with your dogs? You know, I, I, I've trained my dogs 
But do I communicate with them or are they just trained? Uh, we'll have to debate that. But we're going to focus in this class on human communication. And you have to have two knowing participants. And you're going to have to have two knowing participants because you parents out there will get this. You're standing four feet away from your child and you will tell them to do something and they will be completely and totally oblivious to you. We've all seen that in other circumstances. When you're in a department store and you're trying to get a clerk's attention and you say 14 times, excuse me, excuse me, until finally you basically yell and then the clerk yell, excuse me, and then you turn around and the clerk goes, you don't have to yell. Okay, so there has to be two knowing participants. Both need to be aware of the fact that they are engaged in a communication process. Second of all, there has to be a message. There has to be something you need to communicate. It can be verbal, it can be visual, it can be nonverbal, uh, to which a meaning can be attributed. Now, oftentimes when we think about a message, we think about uh, just the, the, a written word, what we call verbal communication. Uh, verbal communication, we're going to discuss this later in the class, is just the words you choose to use, the language you use. But it doesn't always have to be verbal. Okay, I, I drive back in the before times when we were when I was going to uh, campus fairly regularly. I would drive back and forth uh, along I twenty from Grovetown all the way out to the Aiken exit. And on many, many, many occasions, I would be uh, cut off by a car or a truck uh, who, with complete total disregard for my existence as a human being, would cut me off. And, 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 and then I took the opportunity to communicate without using words, oftentimes with a particular hand gesture that we're probably all familiar with. But that would be my message. So you have to have something that you want to communicate, and you have to be able to do it verbally, visually, yeah, and there are even those people who say you can do it tactily. We're definitely not going to get into the whole touching communication thing in this class. Uh, even if we were in the classroom, we wouldn't be doing that. Okay. The third thing you need is a channel. You need a way to communicate. We are using YouTube as a channel. Okay. We will use Zoom as a channel. We will use email as a channel. You can use smoke signals. You can use carrier pigeons. You can use email. You can use the telegraph. You can use any, it is the means by which you pass the message. Okay, and again, it can be sound, it can be visual, it can be tactical, it can be anything. All right. One of the things that you know communicate. You, you probably noticed this <coughs> is when people have a low wall in a very popular, very popular area. They will put little spikes on the top of the wall to keep you from sitting on their wall. That is a channel to communicate. I don't want you sitting here. Okay, And then the last thing that we have to have is we have to have feedback. Now, feedback is the reaction and response we have to the, 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 the participating parties. Okay, by two knowing participants, if you want to take a great class, SBC 209, I teach it, we'll talk about situations where there are more than two knowing participants in small groups. But there has to be some opportunity for information and for messages to flow back and forth between the participants. Okay, that feedback is how we communicate, and we're going to talk a lot about feedback in this semester. Feedback is going to be very important. Now, a lot of people ask me at this point, they stick their hands up and they say, well, how, you know, this is a lecture environment, and this is even more of a lecture environment than I've ever been involved with to a great extent. How do we communicate if we're not saying anything, if there's 40, 50, 800 people in a room, how do we communicate? Well, this is how we communicate. Uh, facial expressions. There have been any number of times when I have been giving a lecture <clears throat> and I have looked out at the class of, of you know, I, I've lectured in groups as big as uh, 150 and I have seen, uh, you know, uh, number two there. They're like, what? And they don't even have to say it. But number one, uh, these all, and here's the associate emotions we associate with these disgust, fear, joy. Surprise, sadness, and anger. I mean, when you look out into a room of 35 and 40 people and you see number six, you know you need to start doing some extra explaining. Okay? That's just the way things work. All right? So, those are the four basic components of all human communication. All human communication has to have at least two knowing participants, has to have a message, has to have a channel, has to have feedback, has to have people involved, 
has to have something to say, has to have a way to say it, and has to have a way to respond is the way to think about those. All right? So what we're going to be doing for the next several minutes is we're going to be walking through some models of human communication. Now, this is nothing new. Um, Aristotle was the first person, you know, dead Greek guy, was the first guy to actually model uh, public speaking. Uh, and he did it in the 4th century BCE. Uh, Aristotle, in his book, Rhetoric, uh, was the first to really explore human nature scientifically, to try to break it down into its constituent parts so that we can better understand it. We know that his this model that you're looking at here, of course it was written in Greek, it wasn't written in English, existed by 300 BCE. Okay, so it, it is it, this, this model that you're looking at here is, is 2,300 years old at a minimum. It may have existed before that, but we know it was around in 300 BC. But the model is speaker-centered, and the audience is just passively influenced. Okay, this is very one-way communication. All right, um, and it's speaker, speech, audience, effect. Speaker, speech, audience, effect, and then the occasion sort of exists. Uh, is why you're all there. Now, I, I, I said early on about the textbook that textbooks are really kind of, you know, this is an okay textbook. Most public speaking textbooks are okay. And when Aiken Tech came to me and said, hey, listen, what are you going to do for a textbook? And I was going like, well, let's try to find something online. And they're like going, well, do you need to vet it? And I'm going like, the yeah, public speaking has been published for, you know, people have been publishing their ideas about public speaking for about 2,400 years. So I really don't think that there's going to be a whole lot new. And to demonstrate that, okay, this is Laswell's model from 1948. A lot of what we're about to talk about when we start talking about models, you're going to see a lot of stuff from 48, the late 40s, the early, the 50s, and the early 60s. We are going to look at some of the 70s and 80s. But there was an explosion of data out there and models on communication uh, right in, the, in that era immediately after uh, World War II. Uh, Laswell was a political scientist and a sociologist. He authored more than 300 books and 250 scholarly articles on all sorts of subjects. Uh, his focus after World War II was power dynamics. Uh, and you're going to see that a lot as we go through, because here's what happened. So in 1940, from 1939 to 1945, you know, the world was at war. Europe was destroyed by a nation that decided to follow a madman. And a lot of people began to wonder, well, how the hell did that happen? And then at the same time, here in the United States, you had a, uh, an agricultural... In the 1930s, we saw the United States saw ourselves as an agricultural nation, even though we really weren't anymore. Well, in 1940, we completely overhauled the way we, our industry works. We go from making tractors to making bombers. We go from making cars to making tanks. We go from making, you know, anything to making war materials. And we became the industrial engine of the free world. So a lot of people began to look and they say, hey, listen, we need to really understand how Hitler was able to take over all of Germany. And why don't we apply those same techniques we used to talk about how we changed industry in, in, in 1940. And so a lot of these guys that we're going to be talking about were actually, you know, that are studying this were engineers and technical people mathematicians. But anyway, let's get back to Laswell real quick. So you see his basic communication, message, medium, receiver, effect. You've seen that before. And how do I know you've seen that before? Because I just showed it to you from Aristotle. Here's the two in comparison. Okay? Speaker, the communicator, speech, the message, the channel is the occasion because now we have radio, we have print that Aristotle did not have. The receiver is the audience, and the effect is what we're going for. Okay? But what happened at the end of World War II, a lot of people started looking at these old studies from Aristotle and from other people and, and started to apply modern language to it, modern methodologies to it. And they started coming out with all these. There was this explosion of research on communications. One of the first ones that came out was Shannon and in 1949. Claudie Shannon was a research mathematician and an electrical engineer for Bell Telephone Laboratories. Yeah, these are real, you know, liberal arts guys, uh, a research mathematician and electrical engineer. Warren Re Weaver read his works 
and realized that his information theory and model had a wider potential to apply to general communication theory. So they got together, and in 1949, they published a book, The Mathematical Theory of Communication. And again, what we're talking about is, I'm not talking about like speech majors or rhetoric or English majors. These are mathematicians and engineers. Um, and while it started a new field of study, it's been roundly criticized since then uh, for its simplicity. Now, what you see here um, is just sender, message, receiver, feedback, sender, message, receiver, feedback, sender, message, receiver, feedback. It's a very static model. Um, it is a very, and it's called the linear model because the way it's normally laid out is it's laid out in a line where it's sender, message, receiver, feedback, sender. Uh, you can't see what I'm doing with my hands right now, but it's laid out in a line. It has come back in vogue. It's now being taught as a way in all the project management. As, as project management has gained ground as an independent field of study, the linear communications model is being uh, taught as a way to manage projects in a more controlled, uh, more uh, 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 mechanical means of, of, of doing that. The next big uh, thing that came out was the ABX model, which Newcomb put out in 1953. Theodore Newcomb was a social psychologist who believed that communication was how people adjusted to their environment and to each other. Um, a and B can be identified as individuals, or they can be, I, Newcomb said, they could also be identified in groups. The X in this model is the topic that is, he referred to it as, the matter of concern. Anything that can affect the flow of communication between the sender and the receiver. X could be a social controversy that affects relationships. X could be another person that is affecting the relationship between the two persons. X is what we need to talk about in order to maintain our relationships. Okay? Uh, both sender and receiver are at the same level, but their interpretation uh, for the common goal or cause may or may not differ. Okay? So how A and B engage with X can, can change. Okay? So again, in this model, Newcomb sort of expands it to be just from receiver and sender. Okay? But there's also an environment that we're working with or a topic that we're discussing or an individual that is negatively impacting our relationship or maybe positively impacting our relationship that A and B need to engage on. All right? So don't think it's just still restricted to, to uh, the topic being what we're talking about. It can also be a person that is affecting our relationship that affects how we communicate and we may be communicating about them. Okay? Our next model that we're going to look at is the interactional model, and this is just uh, 1954. Charles Osgood just really threw everything into warp drive. He brought forth the idea that there was no, in most communication, there was no uh, a, a sender, there was no receiver, there were just people engaged, and we're going to talk about encoding and decoding in a little bit, but. Uh, uh, Osgood popularized that notion that communication was circular rather than linear. Um, Schramm had adapted the model and added the notion um, that you know, Osgood and Schramm, Schramm adopted, adapted the model and added the notion of uh, a field of experience, commonality. Uh, that goes into, and that was in his papers, added into that encoding and decoding uh, uh, part. Uh, the model breaks down the entire send a receiver. We are just totally in an environment now with this model where we're all engaging, all mixing up. It's a very dynamic model. Uh, it shows, it allows for situations to change through the encoding and decoding. It shows that redundancy because we each have a message and we send, you know, and we respond to messages. Um, and it makes feedback a central core part of ongoing communications between humans. Then we get to uh, Dean uh, Barlin, uh, his 1970 transactional bar, uh, uh, model. Um, Barlin uh, spent World War II in military intelligence and was a code breaker for, uh, in, in, in cryptanalysis and was one of the fathers of what we now know as modern computers. Uh, Barlin said that communication in, in, is, is a word Communication is a word that describes the process of creating mutual meaning. 
And that was just like, well, hold on a second, stop. That just everybody else had been focused on the mechanics of it. Barnlin started really looking at why do we communicate, and the commu- and the reason we communicate is to create a, a, a unified meaning that we can all understand. Uh, the trans and this is a very simplistic view of the transactional model. I could I, there is a, a model that I have a copy of. It's got I think like last time I tried to count it, I counted over eighty nine separate independent parts. There's a whole lot of squiggly lines. This is a the, the model has multiple layers of feedback going in both directions at all times. So what you see here also that Barlin is updating it from individuals talking face to face to where he's now expanding it to a group communication situation like in a, in a classroom. But this also can be expanded. Barlin's model in 1970, he begins to see the value of expanding models to include mass communication. So the guy in the lovely blue sweater here on the left hand side of the screen could be talking about, you know, talking into a microphone that is being broadcast over radio. It could be broadcast over television now. Uh, we would say he could be streaming it over Facebook Live or any number of other live streaming uh, applications. Uh, the actual model includes filters like personal prejudices and noise from outside influences. And b- ultimately, he says, communication depends on the sender and receiver understanding the codes each other uses to communicate. But if a relationship is to grow, shared codes and meanings have got to be built. So while it's possible for us, and we're going to talk about this, it's going to be really important in a couple of minutes when we're talking about uh, uh, dialogic theory. So it's really important for us to, when we first meet, we use a cultural code that we all share at some level. But if we are going to join into a relationship, we have to develop a code and we have to develop symbols that we share mutually that will enhance our ability to build that relationship. That was uh, uh, new. And again, Barnum was a computer guy. He focused on how codes are translated between, transmitted between computers. And then he sort of tried to, and he applied that to how humans communicate. And those shared codes that we have to develop define how we become closer. And if you think about it, you've got people that you know at work, that you sort of know at work, that you have some casual conversations with. And over time, some of them may become very good friends. Well, if you think back on the way you spoke with that very good friend five, six, ten years ago, and the way you talk to them now, you will see that you have inside jokes, shorthand comments for people, and things along those lines. Okay? So the next one we want to talk about is, this is one, uh, my favorite model. Um, and it's a little, it, these are a little out of chronological. Barlin's transactional model uh, came after this, but I think Dance's Helix model is really, really key. Dance's Helix model begins with the concept that human communication is irreversible. Frankie X. Dance was an Army veteran who also worked in cryptology and code breaking, so he's very into how code, how we encode and decode uh, messages, and that communication is irreversible. We've all heard the concept that uh, you can't unring a bell. And what that means is, is once you say something, you can't take it back. I mean, we've all been in fights. Uh, and I can think of one very specifically that when we were, I mean, I've been married 20 years. Uh, when my wife and I first got married, uh, my mother-in-law was just a train wreck uh, at our wedding. Um, she had done everything she could. She didn't like me. She still doesn't like me 20 years later. Uh, she didn't think we should be getting married. She told my wife that on a fairly regular basis. So she caused a lot of stress in our our marriage early on. We've gotten past it. We're, we're fine now. But there was a fight when early on in our marriage where we were really, and for those of you who were married, you know the kind of fight I'm talking about. It only happens every once in a while, thank God, where we were really just hammer and tongs going at each other. And I... Uh, uh, was was trying to keep control, and then suddenly, you know, it flew <coughs> it flew out of my mouth, and I'm just like sitting there going, you know what? I may be bad, but at least I'm not your mother. And as soon as I said it, I stuck the words. I'm very sorry I said that, but it didn't make any difference. That bell had been rung. Communication between me and my wife changed to a certain extent for 
ever, and there are still times, 28 years later, when I still get that comment pushed back at me. And I, and I deserve it, let me say that. So what Dan says here is every interaction changes the very nature of the relationship. So we're going to start here at the bottom of the screen with person number one and person number two, P1, P2. Person number one will say something to person number two, okay? Well, person number two will respond. And his response inherently changes person number one. So P1 no longer exists. We are now at P1A because that communication has affected the way they view the relationship. That if, uh, communication affects the way P1 views P2. That uh, uh, affects the way that P1 will encode and decode messages to P2. And so when P1A responds to P2, that creates P2A. Okay? And then when P2A responds to P1, P1B is now formed. And when P1B responds to P2A, we now create P2B. All right? And then that goes on ad infinitum. All right? Okay, mind blown. Got it. That's kind of hard to wrap your head around. But remember, you can never go back to a place you were previously in a relationship. Okay? It's always going to be there. So once you say something to someone, once you communicate with someone, uh, in, in, in little small ways, it always affects the relationship. Okay, so let's talk about one other thing real quick that comes here at the very end. Uh, we're going to talk about Stuart Hall's encoding and decoding model. Uh, Hall was uh, active in audience theory. That focuses on uh, an audience's engagement with a text or a message. So, what Hall is trying to show here in this diagram is that when we think of a, our message that we want to uh, impart, okay, we come up with what I mean over here, the messenger on the left hand side. Okay, this isn't, doesn't include feedback, this is just how encoding and decoding works. So, the messenger comes up with what they want to say, their message. They put it through some sort of input, uh, 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 through some sort of coding, through the message, okay? They code it into, even into English language, okay? Or even into some sort of nonverbal communication. They will encode it, the message will be passed, and then the recipient will get the message, <coughs> and then they will decode it. Now, is the message that they decode the same as what the, the messenger encoded? You know, in general terms, you know, depending on cultural biases, depending on any number of things that can and do oftentimes go wrong, yeah, uh, in general terms, if we're all speaking the same verbal language, then yeah, we always understand it. But this is way, way, again, this is a very simplified version of, of, of Hall's encoding-decoding model. Uh, remember that we also are communicating verbally and non-verbally. And a lot of times when we get confused is that people, when a verbal message and a non-verbal message are in conflict, like you're nodding your head yes, but you're saying no, people are going to cue in on the non-verbal message. And that is all encoded into the same message, Okay. So that is, and, and I will tell you that as soon as you start encoding the message, what I mean in this slide, okay, you begin to lose the specific specificity you had that the message had when it was just existing in your mind, okay? And then when you further decode it at the recipient <coughs> with what I understand, it becomes even uh, uh, further from what your initial message is. Now, remember, if we jump back to, um, uh, oh, who was it? Was it Osgood and Shram? Uh, I mean, if we you know, go back and we start talking about building those codes and, and, and so that we have better communication, that will make the encoding and decoding possible, more, more precise, as time goes on. Okay? That's how we build relationships, and that's why we build those codes. Okay. Last idea in this lecture is dialogic theory, okay? So what we've talked about so far is those four components. There's the 
uh, the the two com uh, two participants, a message, a channel, and feedback. So what we've seen is that, and again, usually we think of it as being circular. All right. But many of us see public speaking as a one-way communication where you sit and I talk to you and you receive and you don't communicate. But all communication is a conversation, a dialogue between at least two people. Uh, if you go back to the components of communication, you have at least two people, you have feedback. Then when you incorporate Barlin's transactional model and Dance's Helix, we have to have a method to provide feedback. Jump all the way back to the second slide, and you remember those six facial expressions. Okay? You have feedback. So let's look at the characteristics of dialogue. Okay? The dialogue is going to have five characteristics. A dialogue has got to have mutuality. It's got to be a recognition. We have to agree that we are in a conversation. Okay? Dialogue has to have what's called propinquity. Pro uh, pro propiquity, and that's got to be spontaneous. Uh, we can't script a conversation. We have to be prepared for when the other person talks, It's they're going to react in a way that we didn't plan, and we have to respond to that. And if we're truly engaged in a dialogue with them, we will be able to spont spontaneously engage in interactions. We have to have empathy. We have to have supportiveness of everyone in the conversation. Okay, everyone has to be enjoined, and we have to be able to allow them to speak and view their voice, their uh, ideas and opinions. Okay, there has to be some. There is some, always going to be some form of risk. Okay, you have to allow them to engage with you on their own terms. Otherwise, you're not in an honest relationship. Uh, you're in a. Uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, when a person doesn't allow someone to engage in the relationship. On their own terms, the relationship can become abusive. Okay? And then finally, you have to have a commitment. All right? The degree to which an individual will give themselves over to the dialogue. You have to have everyone, even if someone does not agree with the views of the other, you have to acknowledge that their views are valid and try to find some sort of common ground. So you're sitting there saying, well, how does dialogue theory work in public speaking? Well, I'll tell you, it works in mass communication. Okay? Right now, in public relations, the, um, is that the last slide? That's it. Okay, last slide. All right. So let me jump back out to the camera so you guys can actually see me. Okay. So right now, in public relations, the overwhelming theory that is being talked about over and over again, again, when we thought the 21st century was going to throw all this stuff out and we were just going to be, you know, talking through email. The driving theory behind in public speak, uh, public relations right now is dialogic theory. Corporations and advertising agencies are trying to figure out how we build that mutuality, the spontaneity, the empathy, the risk, the commitment, so that we get people to buy into our corporation or our brand like they would buy into an individual. Okay, like they have they're having a conversation with us. The first people that really grabbed this and sort of ran with it was the Country Music Association and the country music industry. Uh, they started setting up fan weeks, and they wanted to make their fans think that they could, they had some sort of an individual relationship with the, the, the country music stars. Okay? Uh, and other people jumped on board. I mean, you know, the Kardashians are nothing but dialogic theory, where they want you to think they're, you're, you're, you're viewing their family almost as a member. Uh, the adult entertainment industry has really latched on in, 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 in to dialogic theory. Wendy's Twitter account, if you ever want to have a good time, go read the Twi Wendy's Twitter account. Whoever runs that is, is sassy, they, 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 they're, they're quick, they're snarky, uh, but they want to give you the impression that you are witnessing, even though it's run by a big, huge uh, corporate advertising agency, they want you to think that when, when you read the Wendy's Twitter account, you're engaging with Wendy. Uh, the Beef Council has also done a lot of stuff with their online social media. If a corporation is really heavily investing in social media and really trying to engage with people on social media, they are running dialogic theory. And that's the long and the short of it. Okay? So we have to focus, and you're going to hear me say this a million times this semester. 
you need to be having a dialogue with your audience. You need to be making eye contact with them. You need to be engaging with them. You need to be reacting to them. Our entire method of delivering speeches in this class, the extemporaneous method, is done just so you can engage with your audience in a dialogue. Okay? All right. <clears throat> so that concludes lecture one. Um, probably should have told you this at the beginning of the lecture, but uh, before the day is out, I will be posting uh, all those models onto the Blackboard page so that you can see them. They will be there. That way you don't have to go back through and try to draw everything out. The, the, the slides I used are in a PDF. I'll upload them later on today. Um, for those of you who have gotten to the end of this, it's Thursday afternoon. I'll probably get this uploaded around 4 o'clock. I had one of those Zoom meetings with my department chair. Uh, the, the, the communications department is having a Zoom meeting uh, at 4.15 today because our boss believes that face-to-face -face communication is important, which I wholly support. Okay. Uh, again, uh, virtual office hours have been posted. We had our first one a little while ago. We'll have another one on Monday. I'll get an announcement about that out fairly soon. Uh, and with that, I will tell you, uh, send me an email for any questions you have, any questions you have about the lecture. Monday at 10 o'clock will be our next uh, uh, virtual office hours. And uh, with that, stay well, stay safe, and we will see you soon.